I'm very honored to be here with these wonderful scholars, and I've enjoyed so many of the papers. Um, I'm going to tell you a quickie little, I'm the storyteller. I'm going to tell you a story. The Man of Iron or the Conqueror is Genghis Khan. The Man of Letters is his chancellor, Yelu Chutsai. And this is the story of how when the conquest occurred of China, Genghis Khan had no idea how to administer a civilized society. And it is a mark of his genius, his organizational genius, and the fact that he knew what his limitations were and he was humble, that he could recruit from the fallen and deposed Jin dynasty, it was a conquest dynasty in North China, a Confucian scholar from the highest levels of government to come to work for him. And to, as Gelu Chusai said, the empire may have been won on horseback, but it cannot be governed from horseback. And he invented the government that the Mongol Empire used to rule throughout. So <clears throat> I studied with a great, great, great historian and I built my research on Maris Rasabi's research, and I presented it as a story so that general readers, not just scholars, could come to understand. It's a fabulous, fab it's about a family and a period and the important question of what is the nature of rule? What is the nature of government? And Yellow, it, I'm giving you as though he were leaving a history of his time with Genghis Khan working so closely with him, he's telling you the story of how he came to be where he was and his assessment. So this is in the voice of Yellow Chutsai. I'm reading it to you, but it's Yellow's narrative. <clears throat> beyond the Great Wall, which marks the frontier of civilization, beyond even the Gobi Desert, lies Mongolia, the land of blue sky, the setting of the story of Genghis Khan, who is called by his people, conqueror of the world. The Mongol nobility call me Chancellor Yalu, but my full name is Yalu Chutsai. I am half Chinese and half nomad of the tribe of the Khitan. My mother was a Chinese noblewoman. Through her, I received a classical Chinese education. I speak both Chinese and the languages of the steppes. As a good Confucian, I look for moral order in history. My fellow scholars would not like to hear me say this because they loathe the nomads and feel superior to them, but I have found moral order among the Mongols who wreak such havoc on our civilization. I have observed the Mongols closely for almost 13 years as of the time I write this memoir. In cutting their wide swath across the world, they have left mountains of skulls, taken bags of ears, and devastated fertile lands. Still, I must tell you that Genghis Khan was not bloodthirsty. These terrible acts gave him no pleasure, but were his method of waging war. He never left an enemy population behind the advancing front lines of his army. If my fellow literati will not give the great man his due, let me record here how greatly I admire his courage, his discipline, and the skill in warfare which allowed him to master not only China, but the world. The Mongols invaded China in the year 1211. Here is the question I pose to my fellow Chinese historians. If Genghis Khan was such a barbarian, why did so many Chinese generals defect to the Mongol army? Why did the Jin generals help the Mongols to win? This is my answer. Genghis Khan gave out orders that any Chinese or officer who came to his side would be given good treatment and a command in his army. Many generals and engineers trusted to his guarantee and came to the Mongol side. Genghis Khan was as good as his word. These military men helped Genghis Khan master the art of siege warfare, and this was the turning point of the campaign. The Chinese commanders were men of the world. They could read signs and omens, they realized that this was not merely a barbarian raid. The Mongol Khan had acquired the mandate of heaven, and he was destined to be the new ruler of China. At first, Genghis Khan allowed his army, which had been on operations inside of China for four years, 
to plunder North China because he could not see how to take the capital. A nomad army existed for the purpose of plunder. He rewarded them with booty. He went to his summer camp in Dolan Nor to fatten his horses for the ride back to the steppes when a Chinese general, a commander from the capital, defected and came to his tent. On a drunken evening, the general informed the Supreme Khan of the turmoil inside the Chinese capital. There had been a palace coup. That is why the emperor had not set an officer to reprimand the invader. Genghis Khan promised good treatment and a command to any Chinese officer who came to his side. The Supreme Khan changed his tactics. If he could not take the capital by force of arms, he would blockade it. No supplies went in or out. He forced the opening of the gates. The capital fell in the year 1215. The Jin themselves had been semi-nomads, had ridden down from their homeland of Manchuria to conquer North China. All this had befallen North China in the wake of the Tang Dynasty with their capital. The Jin had conquered in the Northeast, but they lost the Mandate of Heaven. This was a monumental event. A dynasty had fallen. It was an event of earth-shattering proportions. I did what was called shaking off the dust of the world. I went to a Buddhist monastery where I sought enlightenment under the guidance of the Grand Abbot. I meditated long hours trying to eradicate the vision before my eyes of my world falling apart. What good were worldly treasures and worldly possessions when, Su when Chengdu was a smoking ruin littered with corpses, the gutters running slick with fat rendered from human bodies? There was nothing left of my world. What was I to do with the rest of my life? During those last days of Jin, soldiers came to the capital bringing news of the situation in the fortress towns which the Mongols had taken. They told the emperor of heaps of white bones piled as high as city gates, white bones strewn along the roads, white bones decorating the sides of steep ravines where the bodies of soldiers had been tossed. The armies of Genghis Khan set fire to silk-leaving villages with mulberry tree orchards and behind them left de desert. In truth, I must also record that the inhabitants of the towns which voluntarily surrendered to the Mongols saved Genghis Khan the trouble of going to war, and he spared them. Their officials were taken into the civil service of the Mongols, and their soldiers were taken into the Mongol army. The people in the cities were destitute. As cold weather came on, they removed statues of the Buddha from temples and chopped them up for kindling wood. Miraculously, the capital was retrieved. Why was this? The supreme capital could not take Chengdu by force of arms. It was a military feat beyond his capability. The capital had walls 40 feet thick and 18 feet high. His cavalry, he had, he gave orders that his army would take the booty and make the return journey across the, the, the steps, the Gobi to the steps. No temple bells rang out in celebration the day that Genghis Khan left China because the army had taken huge bronze bells as plunder. From his camp, Genghis Khan issued orders for General Mukali to take command of the garrison, and then he rode back to Mongolia. Spring arrived, flowers opened in the fields, and the snow-laden sky turned from gray to blue. All was sadness and desolation. Joy left me, and I had no will to, no will to live. I had no idea that within a number of years I, was be I would become the most important official at the court of Genghis Khan. I was to become the senior statesman of the Mongol Empire. Imagine what the Mongols must have thought as they made their sweep of the plain of North China, conquering everything to the sea. Imagine nomads seeing for the first time cities and farmlands stretching for hundreds of miles when all they were used to seeing was a sea of grass stretching to infinity under the brilliant blue sky. The first question that entered their minds was how would they feed their horses? The Mongol generals went, wanted to raise all of North China and turn it into pasture for their beloved horses. This is why I went into Genghis Khan's service. Who else would speak for Chinese civilization? 
In the year 1218, the Supreme Khan sent a Chinese general to the monastery where I resided. The man was wearing a golden tiger tablet, a paizu, of gold, embossed with the image of the tiger to indicate his rank. The inscription was in Chinese and in Mongolian. It read, This is the sacred order of the oceanic emperor Genghis, who is beloved of heaven. All commands are to be executed in accordance with the wishes of his envoy. I left the monastery and I rode north to Mongolia, bearing the seal of state of the Jin dynasty. I made what is called a comfortable journey at the invitation of the new emperor of China. I was escorted by his soldiers and I rode in a palanquin which he provided. I was taken to his palace tent, filled with the treasures he had taken from the imperial palace in Chengdu sculptures of gold, jade, and priceless porcelain. I entered the valley of two rivers and marveled at the tens of thousands of white felt tents fanning across the landscape. I passed through the fires which the shamans put at the entrance to Genghis Khan's camp to rid visitors of evil spirits. Keshig officers, the imperial guardsmen, searched me to make sure that I was not armed. These fierce-looking aristocratic commanders ushered me into a brocade palace tent of immense size filled with the treasure taken from the emperor. The son of heaven's dragon throne was placed on a dais. I recognized it. I knew it well. It was made of gold and ivory and cinnabar. Across it was thrown the skin of a white horse, the symbol of Genghis Khan's rule. Only he was allowed to ride white horses and drink the milk of snow-white mares. Genghis Khan sat on that throne as though it were a saddle, legs open, torso forward, shoulders squared. He looked as though nothing on earth could unseat him. I presented the Supreme Khan with the Jin Emperor's seal of state. It was his to wield. He ordered one of his guardsmen to take it. He wore the uniform of a Mongol soldier, a long tunic with pleated riding trousers and leather riding boots. He had red hair, which he wore in two plaits hats, and a leather war helmet trimmed in sable. His eyes were amber ringed in gray. He had huge shoulders and a broad chest. I am a vain man, over six feet tall and slender in my long silk scholar's gowns, but Genghis Khan was as tall as I am. The Mongols do not bathe frequently, for they are shamanists and superstitious about the spirits that reside in rivers and bodies of water. They are afraid of the lightning storms of summer. I convinced the Supreme Khan that he would suffer the loss of his soldiers from battlefield epidemics if they did not wash the filth from themselves after battle. The emperor fixed his eyes on me. Under his unflinching gaze, I knew that this was no mere brute of a military man. He was a military genius, and he understood the motivations of men. He questioned me closely. As a high official in the government of a deposed emperor, I was certain that I was to be put to death. My only thought was to conduct myself with dignity. I did not know then how much the emperor admired men of learning. He fixed his gaze on me and announced, I have avenged you and your ancestors by ridding you of the jinn. I was offended. No one, not even a great conqueror, was privy to my feelings about my family. I tucked my hands in my sleeves and drew myself up to my full height. With all due respect, sir, my grandfather, father, and I all served the jinn. I would be a liar if I told you I was happy about their downfall. I would be happier bringing the seal of state to the jinn emperor than to you. The Supreme Khan laughed a booming laugh which echoed through the tent. None of his soldiers made a move. He said, I admire loyalty more than all other virtues, even loyalty to a fallen enemy. If you would be loyal to your lord when it might cost you your life, I will trust you to be loyal to me. I offer you a post in my government. I have no learning. I will make use of your skills. I was 25 years old, and Genghis Khan was old enough to be my father, almost 50. He told me that he admired my accomplishments. I could read and write and was an educated man. He said that he himself was not educated, but he surrounded himself with educated men. He had vision. When he encountered some skill, some technique, some talent that he did not possess, he employed it rather than reject it. He was a genius at organization. He made use of everything.
every person and every resource in his empire. He desired my talent. I am a physician and I know medicine and herbs. Chinese medicine is intimately superior to what the Mongols called medicine. To the Supreme Khan, this was a valuable skill. I knew divining by Chinese methods and can tell fortunes by casting the arrow stalks of the I Ching. At his court, he employed Christians and Muslims from the oasis towns of the Silk Road because they knew how to keep records. He was a curious man, and he de desired to know the will of heaven. My interview satisfied him. The Supreme Khan offered me the post of Bichi Gechi, secretary in charge of official documents. I became the court astrologer and the court physician. I had witnessed the horrors of the Mongol conquest at first hand and decided to accept Genghis Khan's offer. I saw no other way to preserve Chinese civilization. I accepted Genghis Khan's offer to give myself a reason to live. If I had sought enlightenment in the Buddhist monastery, if I had not sought enlightenment in the Buddhist monastery, I might have hanged myself with a silk cord for the simple reason that my world had come to an end. The Mongols have only had writing since the conqueror gave them a script in the year 1206, a mere 20 years ago. They are not accustomed to the writing of history, nor do they have literary style and the skills necessary for the keeping of records. My fellow Confucians, those who fled to escape him, will memorialize Genghis Khan's bloody deeds, but they will be unable to abandon their belief in their own superiority long enough to record the truth about him for future generations. Only I can tell that he was a genius at war, that his warfare, far from being ruthless, bloodthirsty, and savage, had a morality, an elementary logic all its own. He never left a civilian population behind the advancing front lines of his army. That was the reason for the slaughter. This was my task. Only I can tell how I helped to civilize Genghis Khan and eradicate the worst of Mongol ways. Once I was tasked with forming the government of the Supreme Khan, I appealed to his greed and not to his compassion. I told him that it would be more profitable to tax the population rather than to slaughter them. I proved to him how much profit he could gain from agricultural products once the regular seasons were reestablished after the years of warfare. I convinced him not to put North China to the torch. There was chaos in North China, but with my programs, orders was restored. The peasants came back to the land and ended their exit for the south where a Han Chinese emperor sat on the dragon throne. I write my memoir in the year 1227, the year of Genghis Khan's death, in order that I, who have stood beside him on the battlefield and helped him administer his empire, may write his history. I set my seal to this document from the Supreme Khan's capital of Karakoram in the Mongol homeland, a city of tents in the steppes. The Mongol nobility have gathered from the ends of the earth, and they have ratified Genghis Khan's choice of his third, third son, Ogode, as his successor. The new Supreme Khan has invited me to continue in my post, and I have pledged him to serve him as faithfully as I served his father. This is the document of Yela Chutsai in Karakoram in Mongolia in 1227. Any questions? Thank you very much for that very interesting uh, novelization presentation of, uh, of, of, of the life of Chinggis Khan and Yellow Chutsai. Um, are there any questions or comments uh, from the audience about this? About this, uh, you can call it, I could say, I don't want to say paper, maybe say performance, dramatic performance. The story, the story. <laughs> well, I have, a, I, have a, I guess, a comment, which is, um, I'm very interested in what sources you used uh, for writing this. Even a story needs to have some kind of source. So, what were the uh, what were the uh, uh, primary or secondary sources that you were able to find about uh, to, on the basis for this uh, this story? 
Yes. I used all the best sources from Morris Rasabi's research, and my principle was the secret history of the Mongols. And then I used the anecdotes from the great history of Rashid al Din, who is known as the, who wrote about the successors of Genghis Khan, and um, some sources in Chinese history. But I based it on Morris Rasabi's research. I followed his research, and he plays the tree. So very interesting. So I think also it's very. I mean, many of us have thought about writing historical novels and, and things like that of the Mongol Empire because, of course, it's. A, such a dramatic, uh, such an extraordinarily dramatic period. So thank you very much for that very, very, uh, very interesting novelization or storytelling uh, episode to begin. Narrative history, right. Thank you very much. <laughs>